Doubtless the discovery and narration of these facts will be disturbing to every Osage now living, as they will be embarrassing to the living descendants of the old rugged American pioneers. But Osage history is not for the sensitive soul who would avoid unpleasant facts. Hello everyone, and welcome to the 160th episode of Analyzing Evil. In this video, we're going to explore the story of the Osage Reign of Terror, which has recently been brought to light by Martin Scorsese's film Killers of the Flower Moon, which he adapted from the novel of the same name by David Gran. As beautiful as the film is, for me, it's a film that joins the ranks of other harrowing stories that needn't be watched more than once. Think Saving Private Ryan, Come and See, or Schindler's List. Films that, while being masterpieces in storytelling and artistry, are so horrifying and heartbreaking that only the few wishing to further study their history, themes, and technicalities need watch them more than once. There is nothing fun about Killers of the Flower Moon. It's a story that chronicles the despair of real people who felt the cold touch of evil emanating from the hands of one real-life villain, William K. Hale, and his myriad cronies. So considering the misery they contain, should you even watch Killers of the Flower Moon in films like it? Absolutely. Each and every one of us is made better by learning about the struggles of our fellow humans in such an intimate way, and I encourage all of you to watch this film so you may better empathize with your fellow man, and so you can better understand the varying ways in which those born under different circumstances, in different time periods, may have endured suffering that could be replicated in your respective worlds, should you refuse to heed the lessons that these tales are attempting to impart upon you. With that in mind, the evil of William K. Hale and his cohorts is made quite evident in this film. However, because it is an adaptation, as well as a dramatization of historical events, many things were left out due to the medium it was presented to us in. Similarly, there's more evil to explore during this period in Osage history than just the actions of William Hale, and the systematic exploitation of the Osage people by dozens of criminals is something that David Grant's book explores that the film unfortunately wasn't able to. This is perhaps the film's greatest flaw, but it's also its greatest triumph, as many people, myself included, would not have become invested in this story had this film not been made, which has given me the opportunity to further your knowledge on this subject. So this video, more than anything, is meant to be a companion piece to the film. But don't think you shouldn't watch this video if you haven't seen it yet, as you'll receive a lot of information here about it that I believe will enhance your viewing experience once you do get around to watching the film. So in order to provide you with as much relevant information to the film as possible, I've used information from two different sources in this video, The Killers of the Flower Moon book, and A History of the Osage People by Louis F. Burns, a man who David Grant quotes several times in Killers of the Flower Moon. Now it's obvious why I've chosen to include information from the former, but to fully understand the evil that's present within any person, or story, one needs to keep in mind all the factors that created such evil, or allowed it to occur. So as fantastic as David Grant's book is, I figured there would be no better source to look to for a deeper understanding of the history that led to the events of this story occurring than a book that was penned by a respected Osage historian. And if after watching this video you still find yourself craving more information about the Osage and the dread machinations of William Hale and many others, I would highly recommend reading both of these books, as what I present to you here is but a fraction of what they have to offer. There's one more thing I need to say before we get started. In the film and both of those books, when referring to natives as a whole, more often than not the word used to refer to them is Indian. In this video, whenever I cite a source that uses that word to refer to natives, I've chosen to change it to the word native instead. There are two reasons for this. One is because I've come to learn that more often than not, when referring to any native people, they prefer to be called by their nation's name, like the Osage, so I've done that when applicable. And two, because as far as referring to natives as a whole, I've seen conflicting information about which term people prefer. Some are fine with any common designation, others aren't, and in my experience, I've always heard the term natives used in lieu of any other, so I figured that this is a fine enough middle ground. But for any natives out there watching this video who know more about this subject than I do, feel free to let us all know what you prefer down below. Also, feel free to correct my pronunciation if I pronounce things wrong. I've done my best to ensure that I don't, but I'm not perfect, so please let me know down below. Now with all disclaimers and introductions out of the way, let's begin. While there is a considerable amount of disagreement about Osage origins, it's clear that the Osage people originated east of the Mississippi. Most scholars agree that the Osage, along with the Ogapa, Ka, Omaha, and Panka people, once belonged to a singular nation of the Gihasuan speaking people that separated into five different nations after they migrated west of the Mississippi. Similar to the origins of the Osage, the reason for this migration is subject to debate. No one knows for certain why the people of this mother nation chose to leave their homeland. They could have been searching for more game to hunt. They may have left following 
following a war with the Iroquois, or it could have been for any number of other reasons. We'll likely never know for certain, but regardless, the people that would eventually become known as the Osage can trace their roots back to this migration. And by the time European settlers made their way into what is today known as Missouri, the Osage had established a thriving civilization and culture around the area of what we now call the Osage River in central Missouri. And according to a history of the Osage people, at the height of their power, they controlled over half or more of Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, which they maintained for 125 years between 1678 and 1827. As the Osage formed their own identity separate from their mother nation, a deeply spiritual culture developed amongst the Osage, which might not seem too surprising a fact when you consider that many people may associate native cultures with a deep sense of spiritualism. But it's been said that out of all the native nations that have ever existed, the Osage were perhaps the most religious of all. Aside from their spiritualism, one of the hallmarks of the Osage culture is a rarity that sets them apart from other cultures, their profound sense of kindness towards even those they consider to be enemies. Like any sovereign nation, the Osage were well prepared to defend themselves in their territory if the need arose. And just like any other people, the Osage have committed their fair share of what we would now call war crimes against other people. But the Osage were ever reluctant to spill blood, and they saw war and violence as the great tragedies that they are. The Osage would often lament the passing of an enemy, showing a remarkable ability to empathize with the human condition. And while the Osage did kill people for offenses such as trespassing in their territory to hunt game, the Osage showed respect when respect was given to them. And if a person or group had the decency to ask permission to hunt in their territory, permission would more often than not be given. Now despite this inclination towards kindness and respect, the Osage had to contend with adversity and conflict like any other nation. And their aforementioned hegemony in their homeland was not without its challenges. Like any other people's living in close proximity to one another. Native nations had been warring amongst each other for thousands of years, which is evident by the possible forced migration of the Osage's ancestors after a war with the Iroquois, and they would continue to do so well into the 19th century. But as most if not all of you are well aware, the greatest challenge to any native nation came in the form of European colonizers and settlers. Now in the example I just gave you regarding the Osage holding on to power in their territory for over a century, there is something unique about the Osage that Burns points out when he cites that figure. In a 125 year period, the Osages performed a feat no other natives duplicated. They stopped the westward expansion of the Euro-American peoples and simultaneously tripled the size of their own domain. Despite this fact, the Osage nation was a bulwark against Euro-American expansion, which means they had to do their fair share of fighting in order to maintain that designation. Though the Osage likely made some contact with the Europeans well before this date, perhaps as far back as the mid-16th century, the first documented instance of European Osage contact traces back to 1712 where the Osage engaged in a battle against the French alongside other native nations. From here, the Osage would have a fairly positive relationship with the French, which is evident by their loyalty to the French cause during the Seven Year War. And in practice, the French returned the favor when dealing with the Osage, despite the fact that they had an official policy of extermination regarding rebellious natives. Though the French were an encroaching power that sought to advance their interests in any way they could, it turns out the Osage decision to support the French may have been the correct one, at least for a time, as the power that consumed French territory following this war, the Spanish Empire, were far less forgiving and much more hostile to native nations. Burns gives us the following insight on this topic. Whereas the French official policy toward the native was harsh and the application enlightened, the Spanish official policy was enlightened and the application was harsh. The requerimiento is a classic example of the contrast between Spanish policy and Spanish practice. This statement of conciliation and assurances was a requirement of all first contact between the Spanish and natives. It was to be read to the natives by the Spanish Spanish leader and witnessed by a priest. Too often it was read in whispers among the Spaniards in the darkness before a dawn attack, or, as some reports say, it was read to the trees around them. Spain used three methods to civilize natives. Perversion of the requerimiento led to outright enslavement of the native or extermination, which was the first method. A second method was the encomiendo system. Again, the official intent was to Christianize and civilize the native. Under this system, a landowner would agree to civilize a native in return for his labor. However, it more often led to virtual enslavement or peonage. The final method was the mission system, which was well-intentioned, but it too led to a form of benign peonage. This is why so many natives opposed sainthood for Friar Junipero Serra. The Osage were well aware of these practices and wanted no part of them. 
Fortunately for the Spaniards, they didn't make any serious efforts to implement these practices with the Osages. Insofar as their character and culture permitted, they generally tried to continue the former French practices. Cervantes' Don Quixote de la Mancha gives us an excellent insight into Spanish character and culture. Jose Ortega adds to these insights in his meditations on Quixote. We're going to continue with this excerpt, but for those of you who don't know the story of Don Quixote, it's important that you know a few things about it before we move forward. From Wikipedia, the plot revolves around the adventures of a member of the lowest nobility, an Hidalgo from La Mancha named Alonso Quijano, who reads so many chivalric romances that he loses his mind and decides to become a knight errant to revive chivalry and serve his nation under the name Don Quixote de La Mancha. One of the central plot points of this story is Don Quixote's belief that a group of windmills is actually a herd of giants, and he then proceeds to foolishly battle with them. Now back to our excerpt on the Spanish Empire. More than these great works, the letters exchanged between the Spanish governors and lieutenant governors of Louisiana reveal the Spanish character. They often tilted with the Osage windmill and their reluctance to face realities. Not once in three printed and bound volumes of their letters did they mention the unusual size of the Osage. It would seem that the Spanish ego could not bear to acknowledge that the Osages were a larger people than themselves. The Osage, like the Spanish, were a proud people. While they displayed a generous amount of egotism, this was tempered by a humility that was absent in the Spaniard. Both peoples were devoted to their religious beliefs. Osage and Spaniard alike were idealistic in their religion. Possibly the arrogance arising from the confidence in their abilities and successes generated a friction between the Osage and Spanish. It is amazing how alike many of their traits were, yet the Osages were realists in all cultural matters other than religion. It was the Osage humility that baffled the Spanish mind. The frequent switch from arrogance to humility was incomprehensible to the Spanish. Like most Euro-Americans, the Spanish Spanish would have difficulty in understanding why an Osage would mourn the death of an enemy he had slain. This contrast in the arrogance of taking a human life and the humility of mourning for taking the life was at the root of much of the Spanish distrust of the Osage. Many factors worked against the Spanish in their relationship with the Osage. Possibly the essential factor was the Spanish viewpoint that the Osages were rebellious subjects. From the Osage viewpoint, they were the subjects of no one, and the Spanish intruders were tolerated only as a means to acquire trade goods. Spanish embargoes of Osage trade caused punitive Osage Osage responses because they removed the only reason the Osage tolerated the Spanish. Trade goods destined for other tribes were looted. After one attempt by the Spanish to exterminate them, the Osage's only response was simply to steal their farm horses. As a result, the Spanish subjects in the Illinois country nearly starved to death because they could not raise their food. Only by lifting the extermination attempt and trading for Osage food could the Spanish save their toehold in the Illinois district. Love, fear, and consent are needed to conduct an orderly government. The most successful governments are those based on love and consent, with a touch of awe growing out of respect. Frederick the Great once became incensed at the bowing and scraping of a servant. He beat the servant with his cane and angrily shouted, Love me, don't fear me. It seems the Spanish tried this policy with the Osages. The Osages' fear of losing trade was the only means the Spanish had to bring the Osages under their rule. They never had the love and often lost the consent of the Osages. The inability of the Spanish to enforce an embargo removed any fear of the Spanish on the part of the Osages. Now the French and the Spanish certainly had their effect on the Osage and their way of life, but they were only the precursor to a power that would eventually claim supremacy over every square inch of this land. And like so many native nations, no foreign power had as much effect on the Osage more than the United States did. Here is what Burns has to say on the matter. The coming of the Americans caught the Osages unprepared to repel the American type of intruders. They were torn by internal strife and were poorly located to effectively resist agricultural intruders such as the Americans. As a result, their dominant status in the heartland of Louisiana was coming to an end. Up to this time, 1803, they had met the French, Spanish, and British. Yet their exposure had been largely to traders and a few habitants. The traders and hunters wanted furs, which fit into the Osage way of life. Habitants typically lived in a few small cluster villages and farmed around the village, which caused little disturbance to game animals. These the Osage could tolerate with few adjustments. A totally new type of intruder awaited the Osages. The coming of the Americans was to present situations that the Osages had never experienced before. They had very little information to guide them in how to respond to these new situations. While they had fought Americans on the Wabash River and helped defeat them, they were well aware of Anthony Wayne's decisive victory at Fallen Timbers in 1794. All too well they knew of the terrible treaties that followed. The battle and treaties that Burns is referring to here was the final battle of the Northwest Native War, the Treaty of Greenville, and the Jay Treaty, which displaced the Native American nations residing in Ohio and allowed for white American settlement of the area. Acting on what little information and experience they did have, in typical Osage fashion, they developed a few guidelines in advance. First and foremost, they were determined to never make war on the United States, and they never did. 
Fallen Timbers had clearly demonstrated the futility and retaliation of such actions. This is the only clear and consistent guideline the Osages had. The others are cloudy because of lack of information and experience on the part of the Osages. They might have suspected that many Eastern Native nations would try to move into their territory. However, they could not have known of President Jefferson's plan to move these nations into their territory on a wholesale basis. Osages did have some idea of the agricultural intruder problem, and had formulated a policy of avoiding the settlers. They hoped that by avoiding contact, they could prevent the conflict. What the Osages did not know was that the United States government had completely lost control of the settlers when it came to Native affairs. Thus, they were totally unprepared to cope with the intruder settler. There is an Osage distinction between a legal settler and an intruder settler. A legal settler settled on lands that had been cleared of Native title, while an intruder settler was on lands to which the Osages still had title. Over a span of years, the Osages had evolved ways to deal with other intruders. Native and hunting Euro-American intruders were killed and beheaded, and their heads were placed on stakes. Trader intruders were robbed and turned back. Intruder farmers were harassed, and their horses were stolen. The American intruder settler presented a new situation. These intruder settlers were not the noble pioneer so often portrayed. This stereotype fits the legal settler much better. The intruder settlers were the dregs of American society, lawless misfits who sought the frontier to escape punishment within their own culture. They were the bohemians of America with one inalienable right. They were citizens of the United States. Loudly and persistently, they proclaimed that right, and they broke every law of the country that protected them. The inconsistency inherent in these people completely baffled the Osages, who were an orderly people. While the Osages had Bohemians, these were cast outside the culture and were afforded no protection. French and Spanish practice had been to protest and frown on the slaying of their Bohemians, but they had let these actions pass as not worth the effort to retaliate. The Osages never really found a solution to the problem of the United States' failure to enforce intruder provisions and treaties, while at the same time punishing the Osages for enforcing those provisions. Governor Joe, Star Chief, came close to finding a solution. He was a huge Osage and better educated than the average Euro-American of his time. Chancing upon some intruders camped in Osage territory, he helped himself to their meal. As he ate, the man and wife discussed their possible fate at the hands of this wild native. When he finished, Joe gestured for them to hitch up and get out. Relieved, they did so and hurried toward the border, discussing their good fortune in escaping with their hair intact. As they neared the border, Joe overtook them, and, in better English than they could command, told them if they came back they would be arrested and tried under Osage law. They never reappeared on Osage lands. Joe thoroughly terrorized them before they hitched up, and when he overtook them, they were certain he had changed his mind and would lift their hair. Baffled in their efforts to halt the deluge of intruder settlers, the Osages were to turn their efforts to the emigrant nations. Osage experience told them that attacking other natives caused less concern than attacking Euro-Americans. They could not have known that this would bring the wrath of the United States government down upon them. Osage attacks on emigrant natives caused those east of the Mississippi to be reluctant to move west of the Great River. It would be more accurate to say it added to their reluctance. Thus, the voluntary removal envisioned by Jefferson ultimately became a mandatory removal by military force under Andrew Jackson. The Osages could not understand this aspect of their own warring on other natives until many years later. No one has fully researched this facet of native removal. It was these unknown factors combined with internal strife and dispersal of the bands that made the Osages so vulnerable as the Americans crossed the Mississippi. One cannot read the historical records without noticing an abrupt change in Osage conduct. No doubt this was partly because of the deep-seated desire to avoid war with the United States. Yet the true causes lie buried deep in the passage of time. Maybe we will never know all the reasons for this abrupt change. Surely the reasons we have discussed were factors in this change, but there were undoubtedly others. The Osages were not sorry to see the Spanish go, but they were not overjoyed to see the Americans come into their domain. Being realistic in their approach to life, they accepted the situation as it was and tried to save what they could of their culture and domain. The Osages had lived with the French realism tempered with a realism which was so much like their own approach to life. No doubt the wonderful Spanish idealism both appealed to the Osages and at the same time repelled them, for it conflicted with their sense of realism. Americans tended to be pragmatic. This brusque approach to life offended the Osage love of pomp and deep idealistic symbolism. Yet at the same time, it inspired the sense of realism in the Osage character. The observant Osage curiosity was continually piqued by the fact that whatever the Americans did, it worked, at least for the Americans. They were amazed at the technological changes that appeared after 1803. Improved firearms quickly caught their attention. New trade goods led to rapid depletion of their game reserve. So great was their desire for the new items of trade. Boats that walked on their rivers brought hordes of Americans to their country. Wagons that were vastly superior to those of the French and Spanish brought more Americans. The changes were so sudden that the people could not adapt to them fast enough. It was a catastrophic force beyond their ability to adjust. They were overwhelmed.
As quick as the onset of the American encroachment into Osage territory was, in the beginning, the outlook for American-Osage relations seemed promising. Take a speech President Thomas Jefferson made regarding the Osage as an example. In his formal address to the Osage delegation on July 16, 1804, Jefferson outlined his intentions. He made 11 major points in his speech. 1. He expressed regrets and sorrow for the deaths of Osages at the hands of the Sac and Fox. A raiding party had killed these Osages as their delegation was leaving Missouri. While Jefferson presented this as a condolence, he also included a clear notice that warring under United States law would not be allowed. 2. In his second point, Jefferson tried to establish a bridge of common bond. He pointed out that Americans were born in America and came from the same soil as those in the Osage delegation. 3. He continued this theme into the third point and assured the delegation there would be no more changes in government. He noted that France and Spain were governed by a European government, but Americans were governed by an American one. 4. The president then entered into trade matters, which had been his main purpose in addressing the delegation. After pointing out the mutual advantage of trade, Jefferson hinted at a government-sponsored fur trading factory, with stress being placed on fair prices and fair treatment. Ultimately, this system was initiated by the establishment of Fort Clark, better known as Fort Osage. 5. Building on the basis of mutual benefit from a fair fur trade, Jefferson's speech turned to the need to expand trade, and he explained the American necessity to explore the Missouri River. In this way, Jefferson opened the subject of exploring Louisiana. 6. Since Jefferson realized the importance of the Osages in these explorations, he promoted his plans to explore the Red and Arkansas Rivers as an enhancement to the Osage trade. Furthermore, he asked for Osage assistance toward the expeditions that would visit them. 7. Besides the Missouri and Arkansas expeditions, Jefferson also announced his intentions to explore Kansas and into the Republican Pawnee country. 8. The rift between the Missouri bands and the Arkansas bands were of great concern to Jefferson. He promised that he would do all in his power to help heal the rift and bring the people together again. To keep peace between the Osages and the Americans, an agent was to be sent among them to settle disputes that arose between the two people. 10. Jefferson invited the Osages to explore and observe the area around Washington, likening it to the American desire to explore and observe in Louisiana. The president concluded his address with a plea for peace among all the nations. Furthermore, we have this excerpt from Killers of the Flower Moon to give us a better idea of President Jefferson's attitude towards the Osage. In 1803, President Thomas Jefferson purchased from the French the territory of Louisiana, which contained lands dominated by the Osage. Jefferson informed his Secretary of the Navy that the Osage were a great nation and that we must stand well because in their quarter, we are miserably weak. In 1804, a delegation of Osage chiefs met with Jefferson at the White House. He told the Navy Secretary that the Osage, whose warriors typically stood well over six feet tall, were the finest men we have ever seen. At the meeting, Jefferson addressed the chiefs as, my children, and said, it is so long since our forefathers came from beyond the great water, that we have lost the memory of it, and seem to have grown out of this land, as you have done. We are all now of one family. He went on, On your return, tell your people that I take them all by the hand, that I become their father hereafter, that they shall know our nation only as friends and benefactors. Note the language used by President Jefferson here when referring to the Osage. He calls the chiefs of their nation his children, and he the father, which is not a word one might use to refer to the leaders of a nation that one intends to coexist alongside peacefully. If we continue with this excerpt, you'll find that notion would prove true not long after this meeting. But within four years, Jefferson had compelled the Osage to relinquish their territory between the Arkansas River and the Missouri River. The Osage chief stated that his people had no choice. They must either sign the treaty or be declared enemies of the United States. Over the next two decades, the Osage were forced to cede nearly 100 million acres of their ancestral land, ultimately finding refuge in a 50 by 125 mile area in southeastern Kansas. Even greater insight into why Jefferson's promises to the Osage and other native nations were so easily broken can be traced back to the Continental Congress and the policy they created in regards to Native affairs. Realizing the importance of Natives to their cause, the Continental Congress in 1775 acted to deal with Native problems. A commissioner was appointed for each of the departments, North, Middle, and Southern. These commissioners were more diplomat than administrator, with men such as Benjamin Franklin and Patrick Henry being appointed to the positions. With the ratification of the Articles of Confederation in 1781, continuation of these policies was assured. Article 6 has two provisions that bear on the policies, and Article 9 contains another provision. Article 6. No state without the consent of the United States and Congress assembled shall send any embassy to, or receive any embassy from, or enter into any conference, agreement, or alliance or treaty with any king, prince, or state. 
no state shall engage in any war without the consent of the United States and Congress assembled, unless such state be actually invaded by enemies, or shall have received certain advice of a resolution being formed by some nation of natives to invade such state, and the danger is so imminent as not to admit of a delay. Article 9. The United States and Congress assembled shall also have the sole and exclusive right and power of regulating the trade and managing all affairs of the natives, not members of any of the states, provided that the legislative right of any state within its own limits be not infringed or violated. It is evident from these provisions that the central government was to not only have the sole right of making native treaties, but it also reserved the right to make all official contacts, including making war on natives. In its short eight years of existence, the Confederation accomplished more than most governments accomplish in a century. To call this government a failure is a gross abuse of the truth. The Confederation issued two ordinances that still stand as two of the greatest legislative acts in history. These were the Land Ordinance of 1785 and the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Regretfully, we must confine our attention to the portions dealing with natives. The Land Ordinance of 1785 opens with a statement of native policy that has rarely been violated. Be it ordained by the United States and Congress assembled that the territory ceded by individual states to the United States, which has been purchased from the native inhabitants, shall be disposed of in the following manner. According to C. C. Royce and C. Thomas, the only exception to this policy was the Sioux natives in Minnesota after the outbreak in 1862. In this case, another reservation was provided, and the net proceeds from the land sale was credited to the Sioux. Article 3 of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 also contains a provision involving natives. The utmost good faith shall always be observed toward the natives. Their lands and property shall never be taken from them without their consent. And in their property, rights, and liberty, they shall never be invaded or disturbed, unless in just and lawful wars authorized by Congress. But laws founded in justice and humanity shall from time to time be made for preventing wrongs being done to them, and for preserving peace and friendship with them. We believe this is a sincere, well-intentioned, but wishful policy statement. Too much is left to interpretation, depending upon which cultural yardstick the interpreter uses. No one in a right mind could ever believe that these policy objectives were ever obtained. The Constitution provided for a federal union instead of a confederated union like the Confederation. Although the proponents proposed the balancing of powers between the central government and the member commonwealths, called states, the central government emerged as stronger in practice. The only specific mention of natives in the Constitution is in Article 1, Section 8, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the native tribes. Since in 1789, native nations were still considered to possess full internal sovereignty and minimal external sovereignty, this clause placed them in a special quasi-foreign nation class. Until after 1815, the reality in North America was that most native nations possessed full sovereignty. The fiction of sovereignty did not become a reality until after 1815. Abandoning the earlier use of nation and using the term tribe seems to indicate that the United States under the Constitution expected to reduce the native nations to subordinate units of government somewhere between foreign nations and commonwealths. Apparently, the native governments of today are somewhat below commonwealth status, but above county government in several aspects. They exist as a unique form of government within the structure of American government, yet apart from all other organized governmental units. With these precedents set by their forefathers, what happened to the Osage Nation and many other native nations as a result of United States policies and actions may not have been as openly violent as the French or Spanish as far as rhetoric is concerned, but the methods employed by the United States government, settlers, and business owners were infinitely more more sinister in nature. It wasn't the promise of conquest and eradication that the Americans brought to the natives. It was smiles and assurances that everything would be okay while they slowly slipped a knife underneath their ribcage. And one of the greatest factors that facilitated this not-so-silent assassination was the overall attitude that Americans had towards natives. Burns describes these views as such. As humans, we see the world through a window of beliefs. While this gives us a sharp focus on what we want to see, it sometimes prevents us from seeing how wrong we are. Therefore, it is important that we understand how Euro-Americans saw the native during any given period. Jefferson set the pattern for beliefs about natives during his generation. He saw the native as a farmer who, through intermarriage, would become a Euro-American. By the end of the Civil War in 1865, Euro-Americans had radically revised this Jeffersonian view. In this period, the native was regarded as one of the damned. Thus, the elect was ordained by God to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Natives had rejected the Christian God and the Euro-American civilization. In doing this, they were damned and could not be saved. Those actions were taken as a clear indication that God meant for the Euro-Americans to have the native lands. These concepts became especially harsh after they had been filtered through the minds of the Civil War generals. The commander of the military division of the Missouri, Lieutenant 
Lieutenant General P. H. Sheridan, had this to say in 1882, the majority of the wasteful and hostile occupants of millions of acres of valuable agricultural, pasture, and mineral lands had been forced upon reservations under the supervision of the government, and the vast section over which the wild and irresponsible tribes once wandered were redeemed from idle waste to become homes for millions of progressive people. Sheridan uses some words, i.e. wasteful, hostile, wild, irresponsible, and wandered, that carry a heavy cargo. It would be interesting to carefully analyze these terms and compare them with truth. In contrast to the derogatory terms used against natives, the sweet, heroic words that were used to describe the achievements of Western civilization stand out. The United States' experience with the Plains natives involves more than regional history. One must view the evolution of attitudes toward the native as a part of the worldwide expansion of the United States. As the native was treated, so were other people in the so-called Third World treated. In a sense, natives were placed in the same category as the peoples of any other subjugated nation. Yet natives often hear of the fiction of sovereignty. The Euro-Americans illogically treat natives as a conquered people, acknowledging that they had been sovereign, yet at the same time, denying that they had ever been sovereign. This attitude invariably leads to the acquisition of native lands that Burns describes as such. One cannot claim that the native land title was extinguished by any order of law. In a few rare cases, some form of Western-style legal order was followed. These exceptions are noticeable because of their scarcity. With few exceptions, native land titles were usually obtained by chicanery of all kinds, coercion, flattery, bribery, false claims, and seldom by outright conquest. Many justifications were offered for seizing native lands, but the fact remains that native lands were taken without any real right and with compensations that were insulting in their insignificance. One of the more insidious beliefs that facilitated the robbery of native lands was the concept of manifest destiny, which is the idea that by virtue of divine providence, white Americans were destined to expand across North America and claim it for their own. The rather horrifying nature of this idea is exemplified through the following excerpt from a history of the Osage people. As early as 1837, in a Phi Beta Kappa speech, Horace Bushnell stated, There are too many prophetic signs admonishing us that Almighty Providence is pre-engaged to make this a truly great nation. This Western world had not been preserved unknown through so many ages for any purpose less than sublime than to be opened at a certain stage of history to become the theater wherein better principles might have their action and free development. Out of all the inhabitants of the world too, a select stock, the Saxon, and out of this the British family, the noblest of the stock, was chosen to people our country. The egoism and absolute ethnocentrism so obvious in this speech was typical of manifest destiny. We have often heard the adage, as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. A parody of this is, what a nation practices at home, it practices abroad. Native policy, which was based upon manifest destiny, is a classic example of this rule. Treatment of the native set the pattern for treatment of third world people. Manifest destiny was clearly present in Commissioner Francis A. Walker's annual report in 1872. No one will rejoice more heartily than the present commissioner when the natives of this country cease to be in position to dictate, in any form or degree, to the government, when in fact the last hostile tribe becomes reduced to the condition of supplicants for charity. This is, indeed, the only hope of salvation for the aborigines of the continent. If they stand up against the progress of civilization and industry, they must be relentlessly crushed. The westward course of population is neither to be denied nor delayed for the sake of all the natives that ever called this country their home. They must yield or perish, and there is something that savors of providential mercy in the rapidity with which their fate advances upon them, leaving them scarcely the chance to resist before they shall be surrounded and disarmed. One may argue that the commissioner was stating conditions as they were and were yet to be. A person in a position to influence the direction of events could also do more than reflect the status quo. This would be especially true when that person was charged with the responsibility of attending to the affairs of natives as a trust requirement. We would be generating a great injustice if we did not point out that efforts were made to stem the tide of manifest destiny. While these efforts did not materially aid the native, it is possible that they eased the impact somewhat. It is more significant that there were individuals who did make a sincere effort to prevent a great wrong. Such people, who are present in all societies both great and small, lift humanity above the level of beasts. The native condition commissioner Walker, despite his weakness as a leader in native reform, was an excellent observer. His summation of the native condition and its cause is accurate and to the point. The freedom of expansion, which is working these results, is to us of incalculable value. To the native, it is of incalculable cost. Every year's advance of our frontier takes in a territory as large as some kingdoms of Europe. We are richer by hundreds of millions. The native is poorer by a larger part of the little that he has. This growth is bringing imperial greatness to the nation. To the native, it brings wretchedness, destitution, and beggary. 
Surely there is obligation found in considerations like these, requiring us in some way, and in the best way, to make good to these original owners of the soil, the loss by which we so greatly gain. The commissioner did not stand alone in his observations of the native's condition. On November 23, 1869, the first report of the Board of Native Commissioners was made. While this report also reflected the same observations as the commissioner's report, it also contained a long list of suggested reforms. All of what we've talked about up to this point led to the Osage removal of the 1870s, which was the forced migration of the Osage from their lands to the Osage Hills that they now occupy in Oklahoma. And here we have another excerpt from a history of the Osage people to better understand exactly how this happened. Without a doubt, the best known removal in United States history is Jackson's removal of the Cherokee. While the Cherokee removal was a great injustice that caused suffering and loss of life, the Osage removal from Kansas was equally unjust, equally full of suffering, and, on a percentage basis, equally costly in lives. However, so little has been written about these aspects of the Osage removal that David Parsons, in his dissertation about the removal, referred to the removal as a simple move with little loss of life or suffering. Subsequent to Parsons reaching that conclusion, new evidence has surfaced. The Osage removal was not an isolated event. It was a result of a shift in native policy. This change became evident after the enactment of the Kansas-Nebraska Bill and the ensuing war in Kansas. Basically, the changed policy was to remove all natives from Kansas. While the Civil War delayed the actual removal, it also provided a solution to the problem of where to settle the native nations that were in Kansas reserves. By requiring the Confederate native nations to sell portions of their native territory reserves in what is now Oklahoma, space was available to colonize the nations from the Kansas reserves. Therefore, from 1864 to 1871, all but a few token groups of natives were removed from Kansas to Oklahoma. During this forced resettlement, the Osage, who had already been battered and broken by the events leading up to the removal, were facing extinction, and many Osage lost their lives as they made the trek to a barren, undeveloped area that lacked in proper medical supplies, food sources, and shelter, an account of which is given to us by David Grant in Killers of the Flower Moon. The Osage had been assured by the U.S. government that their Kansas territory would remain their home forever, but before long, they were under siege from settlers. Among them was the family of Laura Ingalls Wilder, who later wrote Little House on the Prairie based on her experiences. Why don't you like natives, Ma? Laura asks her mother in one scene. I just don't like them. And don't lick your fingers, Laura. This is native country, isn't it? Laura said. What did we come to their country for if you don't like them? One evening, Laura's father explains to her that the government will soon make the Osage move away. That's why we're here, Laura. White people are going to settle all this country, and we get the best land, because we get here first and take our pick. Though in the book the Ingalls leave the reservation under threat of being removed by soldiers, many squatters began to take the land by force. In 1870, the Osage, expelled from their lodges, their graves plundered, agreed to sell their Kansas lands to settlers for a dollar and 25 cents an acre. Nevertheless, impatient settlers massacred several of the Osage, mutilating their bodies and scalping them. A native affairs agent said, the question will suggest itself, which of these people are the savages? The Osage searched for a new homeland. They debated purchasing nearly 1.5 million acres from the Cherokee in what was then the Native Territory, a region south of Kansas that had become an endpoint on the Trail of Tears for many tribes ousted from their lands. The unoccupied area that the Osage were eyeing was bigger than Delaware, but most whites regarded the land as broken, rocky, sterile, and utterly unfit for cultivation, as one Native Affairs agent put it which is why Watian Ka, an Osage chief, stood at a council meeting and said, My people will be happy in this land. White man cannot put iron thing in ground here. White man will not come to this land. There are many hills here. White man does not like country where there are hills, and he will not come. He went on, If my people go west where land is like floor of lodge, white man will come to our lodges and say, We want your land. Soon land will end, and Osages will have no home. So the Osage bought the territory for 70 cents per acre, and in the early 1870s, began their exodus. The air was filled with cries of the old people, especially the women, who lamented over the graves of their children, which they were about to leave forever, a witness said. After completing their trek to the new reservation, members of the tribe built several camps, the most significant one being in Pahuska, where, on a prominent hilltop, the Office of Native Affairs erected an imposing sandstone building for its field office. Greyhorse, in the western part of the territory, consisted of little more than a cluster of newly built lodges, and it was here where Lizzie and Nekai Sewai, the 
parents of Molly Burkhardt, who were married in 1874, settled. The series of forced migrations, along with such white man's diseases as smallpox, had taken a tremendous toll on the tribe. By one estimate, its population dwindled to about 3,000, a third of what it had been 70 years earlier. The Native Affairs agent reported, This little remnant is all that remains of a heroic race that once held undisputed ownership over all this region. Although the Osage still went on buffalo hunts, they were chasing not only food, but the past. It was like life in the old days, a white trader who accompanied them recalled. The old men of the band were wont to gather about the campfires in a reminiscent mood, and there recount the tales of prowess on the warpath and in the chase. By 1877, there were virtually no more American buffalo to hunt, a development hastened by the authorities who encouraged settlers to eradicate the beasts, knowing that, in the words of an army officer, every buffalo dead is a native gone. U.S. policy toward the tribe shifted from containment to forced assimilation, and officials increasingly tried to turn the Osage into church-going, English-speaking, fully clothed tillers of the soil. The government owed the tribe annuity payments for the sale of its Kansas land, but refused to distribute them until able-bodied men like Nikai Sewai took up farming. And even then, the government insisted on making their payments in the form of clothing and food rations. An Osage chief complained, we are not dogs that we should be fed like dogs. Unaccustomed to the white man's agricultural methods and deprived of buffalo, the Osage began to go hungry. Their bones soon looked as if they might break through their skin. Many members of the tribe died. So over the course of over a hundred years, the Osage would lose the land they had cultivated and claimed as their own, in part because of the aforementioned land sessions that the Osage were manipulated into agreeing with, and partly through other factors. Burns describes the period the Osage went through just prior to the removal as a visitation by the four horsemen of the apocalypse, those being conquest, war, famine, and death. But I believe it's apt to include all the horrid things that happened to the Osage up until they were comfortably settled on their new lands as being a part of this visitation. The Osage lands were slowly but surely conquered by the Americans through various means, as we've already discussed. The Osage people continually suffered through wars between other native nations, with European settlers and the Americans, and the effects of wars that raged around them, like the American Civil War. The Osage, like many other native nations, faced starvation as their hunting grounds began to disappear, and also due to the near extinction of the American buffalo, which they relied on for food, clothing, tools, and shelter. And last, but definitely not least, death came for the Osage through the former three horsemen, though death brought with it pestilence as well, as the Osage suffered the onset of viral and bacterial blights brought by European settlers that their bodies were unfamiliar with, like many other native peoples. Not only did the Osage and other native nations have to contend with territorial encroachment through various means, but they also suffered a systematic attempt to destroy their culture, as the prevalent attitude of expansionists towards natives was typically either assimilation, relocation, or eradication. A Native Affairs Commissioner had once said, the native must conform to the white man's ways, peacefully if they will, forcibly if they must. Despite all of this adversity, the Osage managed to survive these turbulent years, and Burns describes it thusly, the Osages had met the four horsemen. They paid a terrible price as the horsemen rode roughshod among the people, but they survived. They emerged from this terrible period decimated and sapped of energy as well as resources. They were sick of the white man and only wanted to place distance between themselves and the Euro-Americans. A testament to their tenacity in this regard is evident by their refusal to allow what happened to them or others around them to repeat ever again. The Osage had seen what had happened to the Cherokee outlet, a vast prairie that was part of the Cherokee's territory and was near the western border of the Osage Reservation. After the U.S. government purchased the land from the Cherokee, it had announced that at noon on September 16, 1893, a settler would be able to claim one of the 42,000 parcels of land if he or she got to the spot first. For days before the starting date, tens of thousands of men, women, and children from as far away as California and New York and gathered along the boundary, the ragged, dirty, desperate mass of humanity stretched across the horizon like an army pitted against itself. Finally, after several Sooners, who tried to sneak across the line early had been shot, the starting gun sounded, a race for land such as was never before witnessed on Earth, as one newspaper put it. A reporter wrote, Men knocked each other down as they rushed onward. Women shrieked and fell, fainting, only to be trampled and perhaps killed. The reporter continued, Men, women, and horses were laying all over the prairie. Here and there, men were fighting to the death over claims which each maintained he was first to reach. Knives and guns were drawn. It was a terrible and exciting scene. No pen can do it justice. It was a struggle where the game was empathically every man for himself, and devil take the hindmost. By nightfall, the Cherokee outlet had been carved into pieces. Because the Osage had purchased their land, it was harder for the government to impose its policy of allotment. The tribe, led by one of its greatest chiefs, James Bigheart, who spoke seven languages, among them Sioux, French, English, and Latin, and who had taken to wearing a suit, was able to forestall the process. But pressure was mounting. 
Theodore Roosevelt had already warned what would befall a native who refused his allotment. Let him, like these whites, who will not work, perish from the face of the earth which he cumbers. By the early 20th century, Big Heart and other Osage knew that they could no longer avoid what a government official called the Great Storm Gathering. The U.S. government planned to break up native territory and make it a part of what would be a new state called Oklahoma. In the Choctaw language, Oklahoma means red people. Big Heart had succeeded in delaying the process for several years. The Osage were the last tribe in native territory to be allotted. And this had given the Osage more leverage, as government officials were eager to avoid any final impediments to statehood. In 1904, Big Heart sent a zealous young lawyer named John Palmer across the country to keep his finger on the Washington Pulse. The orphan son of a white trader and a Sioux woman, Palmer had been adopted as a child by an Osage family and had since married an Osage woman. A U.S. senator from Oklahoma called Palmer the most eloquent native alive. For months, Big Heart and Palmer and other members of the tribe negotiated with government officials over the terms of allotment. The Osage prevailed upon the government to divide the land solely among members of the tribe, thereby increasing each individual's allotment from 160 acres to 657 acres. This strategy would avoid a mad dash on their territory, though whites could then attempt to buy allotments from tribe members. The Osage also managed to slip into the agreement what seemed, at the time, like a curious provision, that the oil, gas, coal, or other minerals covered by the lands are hereby reserved to the Osage tribe. The tribe knew that there were some oil deposits under the reservation. More than a decade earlier, an Osage native had shown John Florer, the owner of the trading post in Greyhorse, a rainbow sheen floating on the surface of a creek in the eastern part of the reservation. The Osage native dabbed his blanket at the spot and squeezed the liquid into a container. Flora thought that the liquid smelled like the axle grease sold in his store, and he rushed back and showed the sample to others, who confirmed his suspicions. It was oil. With the tribe's approval, Flora and a wealthy banking partner obtained a lease to begin drilling on the reservation. Few imagined that the tribe was sitting on a fortune, but by the time of the allotment negotiations, several small wells had begun operating, and the Osage shrewdly managed to hold on to this last realm of their land, a realm that they could not even see. After the terms of the Allotment Act were agreed upon, in 1906, Palmer boasted to Congress, I wrote that Osage agreement out in longhand. Like others on the Osage tribal roll, Molly and her family members each received a headright, essentially a share in the tribe's mineral trust. When the following year Oklahoma entered the Union as the 46th state, members of the tribe were able to sell their surface land in what was now Osage County. But to keep the mineral trust under tribal control, no one could buy or sell headrights. These could only be inherited. Molly and her family had become part of the first underground reservation. And so the Osage, like every nation of natives, were first severely impacted by the machinations of European colonizers, and then by the United States and the new Americans that sought to lay claim to this new world they had found. And now there's a few things that we need to discuss before we move on to discuss the actions of the men and women who took advantage of the Osage during the early 20th century. First is the nature of both conquest and crime. There are exceptions, but it's typically not a specific desire to disfigure or destroy certain peoples that drove the empires of Europe and elsewhere to lay claim to land that had been occupied by others for thousands of years, but the promise of wealth, expansion, and glory should they push the boundaries of their own nations into others. And had the Americas been occupied by peoples of fairer or darker complexions with different beliefs and cultures, they would have surely felt the heavy hand of these interlopers just the same as the natives did. Why this is an important distinction to make is because it provides us insight into how the type of evil that was wrought upon the Osage nation by the malefactors that sought to exploit them during the 20th century is created. In A History of the Osage People, Lewis F. Burns gives us the following quote from Osage Oil by Bill Burkhart. It is a mistake to view these crimes in a different light because the criminals were white and the victims native. This was no race war. Criminals did not prey on the Osage because they were native, but because they had money. Vultures quickly descended on every western boomtown from California to Kansas, from Montana to Texas. The murderers, card sharps, dope doctors, thieves, and shyster lawyers in the Osage would have schemed just as malevolently had their wealthy victims been white, and they would have succeeded equally as well. Lewis goes on to comment that this point was probably correct where the motive was purely to secure money, but some Osage murders did involve bias and attitudes toward the Osages and natives. And he's absolutely correct. Racist views and attitudes certainly aided these criminals in accomplishing their goals, as we'll soon discuss. But despite that fact, it was not racism that drove them forward, it was greed. 
If the black gold found in the Osage Hills had been discovered by a community consisting of any other race or culture, William K. Hale or men like him would have scurried towards this opportunity to find their fortune in any way they could. But regardless, as we've already discussed through their history, it was the racist and expansionist attitudes of the European colonizers and then the United States government that drove the Osage from their homeland into these hills. Attitudes that carried over to the white population of the United States at large that facilitated William K. Hale's and others' plots against the Osage. And though it very well could have been any group of people who endured abuse at the hands of these criminals here, had the circumstances been different, it was the Osage who suffered greatly at the hands of William Hale, and many, many others. So while commenting on whether or not it was going to happen to other people had they discovered the soil instead of the Osage matters for the sake of expounding upon the greed that drives people to commit crimes, it doesn't make sense for us to label the actions of William Hale and others as something that was inevitable, regardless of who found the oil, because it was certainly not an inevitability, as other conditions forced upon other people would have created different scenarios that may have played out in a much less severe or even more drastic way, but we'll never know how things would have played out if someone else discovered this oil. However, we do know what happened to the Osage, and that's why factoring in the history of the Osage and the circumstances that led them to occupying these hills is intimately important in understanding what happened to them in the early 20th century. However, what we've covered so far has been but a small look into how Euro-American colonizers and settlers affected the Osage and the practices, beliefs, and attitudes they developed as a result of their desire to conquer these lands and obtain its resources. But the book that we've derived much of this information from, A History of the Osage People, is a testament to how complicated any given historical event is. And again, if you'd like to learn about the intricacies of everything we've talked about so far, and much, much more, I encourage you to read this book for yourself. Likewise, there is much I have left out in this video regarding how inner Osage turmoil and actions decided how these events would play out. Though they play the largest part in doling out suffering during their conquests, the conqueror often takes advantage of the weak points in any given culture that were created by the people they're attempting to subjugate. But because this video is ultimately about the crimes of white people against the Osage that occurred many years after the affairs we've already discussed, we need only to understand the events that allowed these people to commit these crimes in the first place. One more thing before we move on. It should be said that not every Euro-American who ever set foot on native soil exploited natives, and it is never just to blame an entire group of people for the sins of the greatest criminals amongst them, as there are plenty of Euro-Americans who helped the Osage and other native nations during this time period. And if you'd like to know who some of those people are, there are many to be found in a history of the Osage people. But the title of this series is no accident. We are not here to discuss in detail the virtuous, but the villains and evildoers who have brought so much pain to so many people. With that in mind, it's now time that we begin discussing the main topic of this video, the Osage murders, or more appropriately, the Osage reign of terror. For those of you who haven't seen the film, the central plot of this story is the attempt by William K. Hale, his various cronies, and his nephew Ernest Burkhart to transfer the head rights of the Kyle family to them. Now I will be giving you a general outline and timeline of William's plot later on, but I'm not going to go into intimate detail about the particulars of this plot, as the film does a fine enough job. And as I said in the beginning, this video is meant more so to be a companion piece to the film than anything. So, what you're going to find as we move forward is some information that you can find in the film, but more so a plethora of information that was left out of it. In April, millions of tiny flowers spread over the Blackjack Hills and vast prairies in the Osage Territory of Oklahoma. There are Johnny Jump Ups and Spring Beauties and Little Bluets. The Osage writer John Joseph Matthews observed that the galaxy of petals makes it look as if the gods had left confetti. In May, when coyotes howl beneath an unnervingly large moon, taller plants, such as spider warts and black-eyed Susans, begin to creep over the tinier blooms, stealing their light and water. The necks of the smaller flowers break and their petals flutter away, and before long, they are buried underground. This is why the Osage natives refer to May as the time of the flower-killing moon. And just like these brightly colored flowers, the brilliant Osage people were forced to suffer killers under their own flower moon. In these hills is where the Osage made their new home, in what many assumed was a wasteland. It's true, the rocky soil and tall grass that dominates this region of Oklahoma may not give this land much merit functionally, but beneath its surface lay a treasure worth more than any arable land could ever hope to equal in value. The massive reserves of oil that were found beneath the Osage Hills was referred to as black gold, a term that finds its origins here, and black gold couldn't have been a more appropriate way to refer to it. In the early 1870s, the Osage had been driven from their lands in Kansas onto a rocky, 
presumably worthless reservation, in northeastern Oklahoma, only to discover decades later that this land was sitting above some of the largest oil deposits in the United States. To obtain that oil, prospectors had to pay the Osage for leases and royalties. In the early 20th century, each person on the tribal roll began receiving a quarterly check. The amount was initially only a few dollars, but over time, as more oil was tapped, the dividends grew into the hundreds, even the thousands, and virtually every year the payments increased, like the prairie creeks that joined to form the wide, muddy Cimarron, until the tribe members had collectively accumulated millions and millions of dollars. In 1923 alone, the tribe took in more than 30 million, the equivalent today of more than 400 million. The Osage were considered the wealthiest people per capita in the world. Lo and behold, the New York Weekly Outlook exclaimed, the native, instead of starving to death, enjoys a steady income that turns bankers green with envy. As magnificent as this sudden onset of wealth was, the Osage at the beginning of their reign as some of the wealthiest people on planet Earth were caught in one of history's many intermediary points. The Osage were no longer targeted to be destroyed or removed from their lands, but white American society had not quite yet evolved to the point where tolerance for other races became more so the norm rather than the exception. One of the more prominent examples of this notion is the guardianship program. The U.S. government, contending that many Osage were unable to handle their money, had required the Office of Native Affairs to determine which members of the tribe it considered capable of managing their trust funds. Over the tribe's vehement objections, many Osage, including Lizzie and Anna Kyle, were deemed incompetent and were forced to have a local white guardian overseeing and authorizing all of their spending, down to the toothpaste they purchased at the corner store. One Osage who had served in World War I complained, I fought in France for this country, and yet I am not allowed even to sign my own checks. The guardians were usually drawn from the ranks of the most prominent white citizens in Osage County. Many Osage, unlike other wealthy Americans, could not spend their money as they pleased because of the federally imposed system of financial guardians. One guardian claimed that an Osage adult was like a child six or eight years old, and when he sees a new toy, he wants to buy it. The law mandated that guardians be assigned to any American natives whom the Department of the Interior deemed incompetent. In practice, the decision to appoint a guardian to render an American native, in effect, a half-citizen, was nearly always based on the quantum of native blood in the property holder, or what a state Supreme Court justice referred to as racial weakness. A full-blooded American native was invariably appointed a guardian, whereas a mixed-blood person rarely was. John Palmer, the part Sioux orphan who had been adopted by an Osage family and who played such an instrumental role in preserving the tribe's mineral rights, pleaded to members of Congress, let not that quantum of white blood or native determine the amount that you take over from the members of this tribe. It matters not about the quantum of native blood. You gentlemen do not deal with things of that kind. Such pleas inevitably were ignored, and members of Congress would gather in wood panel committee rooms and spend hours examining in minute detail the Osage's expenditures, as if the country's security were at stake. At a House subcommittee hearing in 1920, lawmakers combed through a report from a government inspector who had been sent to investigate the tribe's spending habits, including those of Molly's family. The investigator cited with displeasure, Exhibit Q, a bill for $319.05 that Molly's mother Lizzie had racked up at a butcher shop before her death. The investigator insisted that the devil had been in control of the government when it negotiated the oil rights agreement with the tribe. Full of fire and brimstone, he declared, I have visited and worked in and about most of the cities of our country, and am more or less familiar with their filthy sores and iniquitous cesspools. Yet I never wholly appreciated the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, whose sins and vices proved their undoing and their downfall, until I visited this native nation. He implored Congress to take greater action. Every white man in Osage County will tell you that the natives are now running wild, he said, adding, the day has come when we must begin our restriction of these monies, or dismiss from our hearts and conscience any hope we have of building the Osage native into a true citizen. A few congressmen and witnesses tried to mitigate the scapegoating of the Osage. At a subsequent hearing, even a judge who served as a guardian acknowledged that rich natives spent their wealth no differently than white people with money did. There is a great deal of humanity about these Osages, he said. Hale also argued that the government should not be dictating the Osage's financial decisions. But in 1921, just as the government had once adopted a ration system to pay the Osage for seized land, just as it always seemed to turn its gospel of enlightenment into a hammer of coercion, Congress implemented even more draconian legislation, controlling how the Osage could spend their money. Guardians would not only continue to oversee their ward's finances. Under the new law, these Osage natives with guardians were also restricted, which meant that each of them could withdraw no more than a few thousand dollars annually from his or her trust fund. 
It didn't matter if these Osage needed their money to pay for education or a sick child's hospital bills. We have many little children, the last hereditary chief of the tribe, who was in his 80s, explained in a statement issued to the press. We want to raise them and educate them. We want them to be comfortable, and we do not want our money held up from us by somebody who cares nothing for us. He went on, we want our money now, we have it, it is ours, and we don't want some autocratic man to hold it up, so we can't use it. It is an injustice to us all. We do not want to be treated like a lot of little children. We are men and able to take care of ourselves. As a full-blooded Osage, Molly was among those whose funds were restricted, though at least her husband, Ernest, was her guardian. It wasn't only the federal government that was meddling in the tribe's financial affairs. The Osage found themselves surrounded by predators, a flock of buzzards, as one member of the tribe complained at a council meeting. Venal local officials sought to devour the Osage's fortunes. Stick-up men were out to rob their bank accounts. Merchants demanded that the Osage pay special, that is, inflated prices. Unscrupulous accountants and lawyers tried to exploit full-blooded Osage's ill-defined legal status. There was even a 30-year-old white woman in Oregon who sent a letter to the tribe seeking a wealthy Osage to marry. Will you please tell the richest native you know of, and he will find me as good and true as any human being can be. At one congressional hearing, another Osage chief named Bacon Rind testified that the whites had bunched us down here in the backwoods, the roughest part of the United States, thinking, we will drive these natives down to where there is a big pile of rocks and put them there in that corner. Now that the pile of rocks had turned out to be worth millions of dollars, he said, everybody wants to get in here and get some of this money. So just as Thomas Jefferson once said that the Osage were his children, the United States government of this period still considered the Osage to be children, and they took advantage of them like an abusive parent, allowing any criminal to come into their home and do what they will with them. But egregiously unjust racial-based legal limiters aside, the Osage were also forced to contend with time spent in the public spotlight, and that spotlight both caused white Americans who saw wealthy minorities as a blight that needed to be destroyed to undermine the Osage, and sent the Cretans skittering in the dark, flocking to its rays so they might taste a morsel of of these people's success. A growing number of white Americans expressed alarm over the Osage's wealth, outrage that was stoked by the press. Journalists told stories, often wildly embroidered, of Osage who discarded grand pianos on their lawns or replaced old cars with new ones after getting a flat tire. Travel Magazine wrote, The Osage native is today the prince of spendthrifts. Judged by his improvidence, the prodigal son was simply a frugal person with an inherent fondness for husks. A letter to the editor in The Independent, a weekly magazine, echoed the sentiment, referring to the typical Osage as a good-for-nothing who had attained wealth merely because the government unfortunately located him upon oil land, which we white folks have developed for him. John Joseph Matthews bitterly recalled reporters enjoying the bizarre impact of wealth on the Neolithic men, with the usual smugness and wisdom of the unlearned. The accounts rarely, if ever, mentioned that numerous Osage had skillfully invested their money, or that some of the spending by the Osage might have reflected ancestral customs that linked grand displays of generosity with tribal stature. Certainly during the Roaring Twenties, a time marked by what F. Scott Fitzgerald called the greatest gaudiest spree in history, the Osage were not alone in their profligacy. Marland, the oil baron who found the Burbank field, had built a 22-room mansion in Ponca City, then abandoned it for an even bigger one. With an interior modeled after the 14th century Palazzo de Vanzati in Florence, the house had 55 rooms, including a ballroom with a gold leaf ceiling and Waterford crystal chandeliers, 12 bathrooms, 7 fireplaces, 3 kitchens, and an elevator lined with buffalo skin. The grounds contained a swimming pool and polo fields and a golf course and 5 lakes with islands. When questioned about this excess, Marland was unapologetic. To me, the purpose of money was to buy and to build, and that's what I've done, and if that's what they mean, then I'm guilty. The public had become transfixed by the tribe's prosperity, which belied the images of American natives that could be traced back to the brutal first contact with whites, the original sin from which the country was born. Reporters tantalized their readers with stories about the plutocratic Osage, red millionaires with their brick and terracotta mansions, and chandeliers with their diamond rings and fur coats and chauffeured cars. One writer marveled at Osage girls who attended the best boarding schools and wore sumptuous French clothing, as if Un Très Jolie Demoiselle of the Paris Boulevards had in inadvertently strayed into this little reservation town. At the same time, reporters seized upon any signs of the traditional Osage way of life, which seemed to stir in the public's mind visions of wild natives. One article noted a circle of expensive automobiles surrounding an open campfire, where the bronzed and brightly blanketed owners are cooking meat in the primitive style. Another documented a party of Osage arriving at a ceremony for their dances in a private airplane, a scene that outrivals the ability of the fictionist to portray. Summing up the public's attitude toward the Osage, the Washington Star said that lament, lo the poor native, might appropriately be revised to, ho the rich native. 
Greyhorse was one of the reservation's older settlements. These outposts, including Fairfax, a larger neighboring town of nearly 1,500 people, and Pahuska, the Osage capital, with a population of more than 6,000, seemed like fevered visions. The streets clamored with cowboys, fortune seekers, bootleggers, soothsayers, medicine men, outlaws, U.S. marshals, New York financiers, and oil magnates. Automobiles sped along paved horse trails, the smell of fuel overwhelming the scent of the prairies. Juries of crows peered down from telephone phone wires. There were restaurants, advertised as cafes, and opera houses, and polo grounds. As we've already touched on a bit, it was not only the average American whose eyes were transfixed upon the Osage, but the criminal and the evildoer waiting to pounce upon their good fortune and make it their own. A U.S. Justice Department official warned that there were more fugitives hiding out in the Osage Hills than perhaps any other county in the state or any state in the Union. Among them was the hard-boiled stick-up man Irvin Thompson, who was known as Blackie, maybe because of his dark complexion, he was a quarter Cherokee, or maybe because of his dark heart. A lawman described him as, the meanest man I ever handled. Even more notorious was Al Spencer, the so-called Phantom Terror, who had made the transition from galloping horses to speeding getaway cars, and had inherited from Jesse James the title of the region's most infamous outlaw. The Arizona Republican said that Spencer, with his diseased mind and a misguided love of adventure, appealed to the portion of the population of the country that fell on false idolatry. Members of his gang, including Dick Gregg and Frank Jelly Nash, were themselves ranked among the most dreaded outlaws of the day. Though some of these figures may have been exceedingly cruel and brutal, few would outdo the evil of one William K. Hale, the mastermind behind the most prominent Osage murders. Hale, who had an owlish face, stiff black hair, and small alert eyes set in shaded hollows, had settled on the reservation nearly two decades earlier. Like a real-life version of Faulkner's Thomas Sutpen, he seemed to have come out of nowhere, a man with no known past. Arriving in the territory with little more than the clothes on his back and a worn Old Testament, he embarked on what a person who knew him well called a fight for life and fortune in a raw state of civilization. Hale found work as a cowboy on a ranch. Before trains crisscrossed the West, cowboys drove cattle from Texas to Osage Territory, where the herds grazed on the lush blue stem grass, and then on to Kansas for shipment to slaughterhouses in Chicago and other cities. These drives fueled the American fascination with cowboys, but the work was hardly romantic. Hale toiled day and night for a pittance. He rode through storms, hail, lightning, sand, and survived stampedes, guiding the cattle into smaller and smaller circles before they could trample him. His clothes carried the stench of sweat and manure, and his bones were frequently battered, if not broken. Eventually, he hoarded and borrowed enough money to buy his own herd in Osage territory. He is the most energetic man I ever knew, a man who invested in his business recalled. Even when he crossed the street, he walked as if he were going after something big. Hale soon went bankrupt, an embittering failure that only stoked the furnace of his ambition. After he started over in the cattle business again, he often slept in a tent on the cold, windy plains, alone in his fury. Years later, a reporter described how he'd still pace before a fire, like a leashed animal. He nervously rubbed his hands into the flames. His rather ruddy face was aglow with cold and excitement. He worked with the fever of someone who feared not only hunger, but an Old Testament god who, at any moment, might punish him like Job. He became an expert at branding, dehorning, castrating, and selling stock. As his profits rose, he bought up some territory from the Osage and neighboring settlers until he had amassed some 45,000 acres of the finest grazing land in the county, as well as a small fortune. And then, in that uncanny American way, he went to work on himself. He replaced his ragged trousers and cowboy hat with a dandified suit and a bow-tie and felt hat, his eyes peering out through distinguished, round-rimmed glasses. He married a schoolteacher and had a daughter who adored him. He recited poetry. The legendary Wild West showman and the one-time partner of Buffalo Bill described Hale as a high-class gentleman. He was named a reserve deputy sheriff in Fairfax, a position that he continued to hold. The title was largely honorific, but it enabled him to carry a badge into lead posses, and he sometimes kept one pistol in his side pocket and another strapped to his hip. They represented, he liked to say, his authority as an officer of the law. As his wealth and power grew, politicians courted his support, knowing that they couldn't win without his blessing. He outworked and outwitted his rivals, making plenty of enemies who wanted him dead. Some did hate him, a friend admitted. Still, Molly Burkhart and many others considered him Osage County's greatest benefactor. He aided the Osage before they were flush with oil money, donating to charities and schools and a hospital. Assuming the mantle of a preacher, he signed his letters, Reverend W.K. Hale. A local doctor said, I couldn't begin to remember how many sick people have received medical attention at his expense, nor how many hungry mouths have tasted of his bounty. Later, Hale wrote a letter to an assistant chief of the tribe, saying, I never had better friends in my life than the Osages. I will always be the Osages' true friend. In this last remnant of the American frontier, Hale was revered as the King of the Osage Hills. Additionally, 
Ernest Burkhart once said of his uncle, he was not the kind of man to ask you to do something, he told you. Now if we take William Hale at his word, and believe that he was indeed a true friend of the Osage, why would he go on to murder his friends, and their family members, for the same reason that the powers of old chose to lay claim to this land? Greed. Perhaps above all other sinister motivators lies greed, the great force within each and every one of us, waiting to guide our hands toward evil in the pursuit of wealth, glory, and grandeur, and there is no better facilitator of greed than the hardship one endures. As was stated a moment ago, William Hale endured the bitter taste of defeat and languished for some time in poverty and misery. For some, that may be enough to drown them in sorrow for the rest of their lives, to the point that they never recover. Others might lift themselves up and manage to return their lives to what it once was. But there are a select few, with an intense spirit and drive, who use such conditions to fuel their ambition, a reminder of what they could be reduced to should they give up. And as David Grant describes, William Hale was one of those people. There was nothing that could stop William Hale, least of all laws or morality, and from one determined man's mind, formed a plot that would end multiple lives, and cause untold pain and suffering to these people's loved ones, and their community. Hale targeted the Kyle family, and anyone who sought to help them fight off the string of murders that plagued their family, and events proceeded in the following fashion. First was the mysterious death of Minnie Kyle, that was attributed to wasting illness, but was likely poison. Next was the murder of Anna Brown, by Brian Burkhart, Ernest's brother, and a man named Kelsey Morrison. Anna was also pregnant at the time of her death, and a not-so-fun fact that was left out of the film, it's possible that William Hale was having an affair with Anna, and she was carrying his unborn child. Then came the murder of the Kyle sister's mother, Lizzie Q. Kyle, by poison. A few weeks later, a cousin of the Kyles, Charles Whitehorn, was shot and killed. Then Anna Sanford, an Osage woman married to Hale's associate Tom McCoy, was murdered, after which McCoy married Hale's niece. After the poisoning of an Osage man named William Stepson, the poisoning of an Osage woman a month later, and the poisoning of an Osage man named Joe Bates, Barney McBride, a wealthy 55-year-old white oilman, went to Washington, D.C. to implore federal authorities to investigate the murders. Barney McBride was murdered shortly after his arrival, and his body dumped in a culvert in Maryland. George Bighart was then poisoned after he began investigating the murders, and shortly afterwards, his friend W. W. Vaughn was killed to further cover up Bighart's murder. Not long after, Henry Rowan, Molly Kyle's first husband, is murdered by an associate of Hale's, John Ramsey. Then Rita Smith, her husband William Smith, and her servant Nettie Brookshire are killed in an explosion that was orchestrated by a man named Asa Kirby on the orders of William Hale. Finally, the poisoning of Molly Kyle by her husband Ernest Burkhart, with the help of the Schoen brothers, began and concluded following Ernest's arrest by Thomas White. It's suspected that had Molly passed, Hale's next move would have been to murder Ernest and his children so their head rights could be inherited by him. Ernest would then go on to testify against his uncle, which saw many of the conspirators in this plot, including William Hale, imprisoned for their crimes. This is a rough outline of the events of these murders, and again, if you've seen the film, you're likely well aware of the intricacies of this plot specifically, and I needn't go into detail about it any further. However, there's something that Grand notes in the book that I'd like to touch on, that being how precarious the case against Hale and his cronies was. There was one question that the judge and the prosecutors and the defense never asked the jurors, but that was central to the proceedings. Would a jury of 12 white men ever punish another white man for killing an American native? One skeptical reporter noted, the attitude of a pioneer cattleman toward the full-blood native is fairly well recognized. A prominent member of the Osage tribe put the matter more bluntly. It is a question in my mind whether this jury is considering a murder case or not. The question for them to decide is whether a white man killing an Osage is murder or merely cruelty to animals. Now as we know, William Hale, Ernest Burkhart, and many others involved in this plot were eventually convicted for their crimes. But as fulfilling as that moment must have been for the Osage, they became decidedly unfulfilled when you consider that both William Hale and Ernest Burkhart were eventually paroled or pardoned, two men who by all rights should have served no less than life in prison for their crimes. After Molly divorced Ernest, she lived with her new husband, John Cobb, on the reservation. Margie, Molly's granddaughter, was told that it had been a good marriage, a period of happiness for her grandmother. On June 16, 1937, Molly died. The death which wasn't considered suspicious, received little notice in the press. The Fairfax chief published a short obituary. Mrs. Molly Cobb, 50 years of age, passed away at 11 o'clock Wednesday night at her home. She had been ill for some time. She was a full-blooded Osage. Later that year, Ernest Burkhart was paroled. The Osage Tribal Council issued a resolution protesting that anyone convicted of such vicious and barbarous crimes should not be freed to return to the scene of these crimes. 
The Kansas City Times, in an editorial, said, The parole of Ernest Burkhardt from the Oklahoma State Penitentiary recalls what was possibly the most remarkable murder case in the history of the Southwest, the wholesale slaying of Osage natives for their oil head rights, the freeing of a principal in so cold-blooded a plot after serving little more than a decade of a life sentence seems to reveal one of the besetting weaknesses of the parole system. Margie said that after Ernest got out, he robbed an Osage home and was sent back to prison. In 1947, while Ernest was still in jail, Hale was released, having served 20 years at Leavenworth. Parole board officials maintained that their ruling was based on the grounds of Hale's advanced age, he was 72, and his record as a good prisoner. An Osage leader said that Hale should have been hanged for his crimes, and members of the tribe were convinced that the board's decision was the last vestige of Hale's political influence. He was forbidden to set foot again in Oklahoma, but according to relatives, he once visited them and said, if that damn Ernest had kept his mouth shut, we'd be rich today. Margie told me that she never met Hale, who died in 1962 in an Arizona nursing home, but she saw Ernest after he got out of prison in 1959. Barred from returning to Oklahoma, he had initially gone to work on a sheep farm in New Mexico, earning $75 a month. A reporter noted at the time, it will be a far cry from the days of affluence as the husband of an oil-rich Osage native woman. In 1966, hoping to return to Oklahoma, Ernest applied for a pardon. The records no longer exist, but his appeal, which went before a five-member review board in Oklahoma, was based at least partly on his cooperation with the Bureau's investigation of the murders. White had always credited Burkhardt's confession as salvaging his case. Despite intense protests from the Osage, the board ruled, three to two, in favor of a pardon, which the governor then granted. Head rights killer wins pardon vote, the Oklahoman declared, adding, Osage is terrorized. Not only does this insight convey to us how warped the justice system can be depending on who's being tried and who's doing the trying, it also reflects much of what we've discussed so far about how centuries of negative associations with other races by Euro-Americans facilitated the crimes of William Hale and many others. Not only were the Osage easy marks for criminals, but they were a people so maligned by the world around them that committing crimes against them was far easier than it would have been if they were white. Make no mistake, if they were white, criminals still would have targeted them, as we've already discussed. But I highly doubt that such widespread abuses of justice would have occurred were the people who found this oil a part of the anointed majority. Why I believe this is the case is due to the fact that the Osage reign of terror didn't just involve the unfortunate few to enter William Hale's crosshairs. It's suspected that perhaps hundreds of Osage were murdered in order to obtain their head rights. In 1926, the Osage leader Bacon Rind remarked, There are men amongst the whites, honest men, but they are mighty scarce. Garrick Bailey, a leading anthropologist on Osage culture, said to me, If Hale had told what he knew, a high percentage of the county's leading citizens would have been in prison. Indeed, virtually every element of society was complicit in the murderous system, which is why just about any member of this society might have been responsible for the murder of McBride in Washington. He threatened to bring down not only Hale, but a vast criminal operation that was reaping millions and millions of dollars. On February 23, 1927, weeks after Paul Pease vowed to disinherit and divorce the wife he suspected of poisoning him, he was injured in a hit-and-run and left to bleed out on the road. Webb told me that the familiar forces had conspired to paper over his death. Maybe you could look into it, she said. I nodded, though I knew that in my own way, I was as lost in the mist as Tom White or Molly Burkhardt had been. I returned to the archives in Fort Worth and resumed searching the endless musty boxes and files. The archivist wheeled the newest batch of boxes on a cart into the small reading room before rolling out the previous load. I had lost the illusion that I would find some Rosetta Stone that would unlock the secrets of the past. Most of the records were dry and clinical, expenses, census reports, oil leases. In one of the boxes was a tattered fabric-covered logbook from the Office of Native Affairs, cataloging the names of guardians during the Reign of Terror. Written out by hand, the logbook included the name of each guardian, and underneath, a list of his Osage wards. If a ward passed away while under guardianship, a single word was usually scrawled by his or her name, dead. I searched for the name of H.G. Burt, the suspect in W.W. Vaughn's killing. The log showed that he was the guardian of George Bighart's daughter, as well as of four other Osage. Beside the name of one of these wards was the word dead. I then looked up Scott Mathis, the owner of the Big Hill Trading Company. According to the log, he had been the guardian of nine Osage, including Anna Brown and her mother Lizzie. As I went down the list, I noticed that a third Osage native had died under Mathis's guardianship, and so had a fourth, and a fifth, and a sixth. Altogether, of his nine listed wards, seven had died, and at least two of these deaths were known to be murders. I began to scour the log for other Osage guardians around this time. One had eleven Osage wards, eight of whom had died. Another guardian had thirteen wards, more than half of whom had been listed as deceased. And one guardian had five wards, all of whom died. And so it went, on and on. 
the numbers were staggering and clearly defied a natural death rate. Because most of these cases had never been investigated, it was impossible to determine precisely how many of the deaths were suspicious, let alone who might be responsible for any foul play. Nevertheless, there were strong hints of widespread murder. In the FBI records, I found a mention of Anna Sanford, one of the names I had seen in the logbook, with the word dead written next to it. Though her case was never classified as a homicide, agents had clearly suspected poisoning. Another Osage ward, Kluatumi, had officially died of tuberculosis, but amid the files was a telegram from an informant to the U.S. attorney alleging that Huatumi's guardian had deliberately denied her treatment and refused to send her to a hospital in the southwest for care. Her guardian knew that was the lone place she could live, and if she stayed in Greyhorse, she must die, the informant noted, adding that after her death, the guardian made himself the administrator of her valuable estate. In yet another case, the 1926 death of an Osage, named Eve's tall chief, the case was attributed to alcohol, but witnesses testified at the time that he never drank and had been poisoned. Members of the family of the dead man were frightened, an article from 1926 said. Even when an Osage ward was mentioned as being alive in the log, it did not mean that he or she had not been targeted. The Osage ward Mary Elkins was considered the wealthiest member of the tribe because she had inherited more than seven head rights. On May 3, 1923, when Elkins was 21, she married a second-rate white boxer. According to a report from an official at the Office of Native Affairs, her new husband proceeded to lock her in their house, whip her, and give her drugs, opiates, and liquor in an attempt to hasten her death so that he could claim her huge inheritance. In her case, the government official interceded, and she survived. An investigation uncovered evidence that the boxer had not acted alone, but had been part of a conspiracy orchestrated by a band of local citizens. Though the government official pushed for their prosecution, no one was ever charged, and the identities of the citizens were never revealed. Then there was the case of Sybil Bolton, an Osage from Pahuska, who was under the guardianship of her white stepfather. On November 7, 1925, Bolton, whom a local reporter described as one of the most beautiful girls ever reared in the city, was found with a fatal bullet in her chest. Her death, at 21, was reported by her stepfather to be a suicide, and the case was quickly closed without even an autopsy. In 1992, Bolton's grandson, Dennis McAuliffe Jr., an editor at the Washington Post, had investigated her death after discovering numerous contradictions and lies in the official account. As he detailed in a memoir, The Deaths of Sybil Bolton, published in 1994, much of her headright money was stolen, and the evidence suggested that she had been assassinated outdoors, on her lawn, with her 16-month-old baby, McAuliffe's mother, beside her. According to the log, her guardian had four other Osage wards. They had also died. Though the Bureau estimated that there were 24 Osage murders, the real number was undoubtedly higher. The Bureau closed its investigation after catching Hale and his henchmen, but at least some at the Bureau knew that there were many more homicides that had been systematically covered up, evading their efforts of detection. An agent described in a report just one of the ways the killers did this. In connection with the mysterious deaths of a large number of natives, the perpetrators of the crime would get a native intoxicated, have a doctor examine him, and pronounce him intoxicated, following which a morphine hypodermic would be injected into the native. And after the doctor's departure, the killers would inject an enormous amount of morphine under the armpit of the drunken native, which would result in his death. The doctor's certificate would subsequently read, death from alcoholic poison. Other observers in Osage County noted that suspicious deaths were routinely and falsely attributed to consumption, wasting illness, or causes unknown. Scholars and investigators who have since looked into the murders believe that the Osage death toll was in the scores, if not the hundreds. To get a better sense of the decimation, McAuliffe looked at the authentic Osage native roll book, which cites the deaths of many of the original allotted members of the tribe. He writes, over the 16-year period from 1907 to 1923, 605 Osages died, averaging about 38 per year, an annual death rate of about 19 per 1,000. The national death rate now is about 8.5 per 1,000. In the 1920s, when counting methods were not so precise and the statistics were segregated into white and black racial categories, it averaged almost 12 per 1,000 for whites. By all rights, their higher standard of living should have brought the Osages a lower death rate than America's whites. Yet Osages were dying at more than one and a half times the national rate, and those numbers do not include Osage born after 1907 and not listed on the roll. Louis F. Burns, the eminent historian of the Osage, observed, I don't know of a single Osage family which didn't lose at least one family member because of the head rights. And at least one bureau agent who had left the case prior to White's arrival had realized that there was a culture of killing. According to a transcript of an interview with an informant, the agent said, There are so many of these murder cases. There are hundreds and hundreds. That's right. 
hundreds, hundreds of souls and their loved ones who felt the greed and cruelty of dozens, if not hundreds of criminals that were seeking to suck the fortunes of the Osage dry like monetary vampires. But just as the Osage survived the coming of the Four Horsemen during a previous period of hardship, the Osage survived the reign of terror that sought to exploit every aspect of their lives for the benefit of others. To believe that the Osages survived intact from their ordeal is a delusion of the mind. What has been possible to salvage has been saved and is dearer to our hearts because it survived. What is gone is treasured because it was what we once were. We gather our past and present into the depths of our being and face tomorrow. We are still Osage. We live and we reach old age for our forefathers. David Grant received the following musing during his research. An Osage lawyer had told me that the reign of terror was not the end of our history, adding, our families were victims of this conspiracy, but we are not victims. Yes, the Osage who suffered in the past were indeed victims. Yet despite all the misery they've endured, Lewis Burns has this advice to give us regarding how we should view the plight of the Osage. Another priority is to avoid the low the poor native practice, which seeks to point to the great evils committed against natives. If this were all it did, it would not be so repulsive, but it also points the accusing finger at all who have descended from these people who treated natives so shabbily. It is an outright bid for sympathy and relieves one of the need to comprehend. The Osages do not need or want sympathy, but they desperately need understanding. Truer words have seldom been spoken. Make no mistake, it's okay to sympathize with the Osage. However, offering your condolences to anyone affected by such trauma is but a courtesy that provides only a small amount of solace to the people you're sympathizing with. It is far more imperative that you truly understand what happened to these people so you might serve as a bulwark against future injustices, a person who sees evil for what it is, and one who acts accordingly to prevent it from harming others. Likewise, Burns is correct in identifying the dangers of only laying the fault upon the perpetrators of any given crime without taking time to wholly comprehend what it is you're blaming them for. In that vein, it's not fair to blame the people of today for the sins committed by the people of the past, but it is fair to expect all of us to work towards healing the wounds inflicted upon others by our forefathers in any way we can, and understanding how they were wrought and what conditions enabled them is the first step towards any sort of reconciliation, the righting of any lingering wrongs, and the prevention of future woes that may manifest from similar situations. Burns said in A History of the Osage People that greed leads to terrible abuses of justice, and throughout the entire history of the Osage, we can point to greed as the primary factor in the suffering of these people. But there is another factor here that enabled these criminals to abuse the Osage, the refusal of one group of people to recognize another as humans just like they. It is not the blood of our respective races that flows through our veins, but human blood. White hearts do not beat any differently than Osage hearts. And though the suffering of the Osage uniquely belongs to the Osage, we should lament the suffering of our fellow man just as much as we might our own loved ones. Vigilance is the name of the game. Watch out for your fellow humans. Decry the injustices laid upon them as loudly as you might decry them if they were placed upon you. As unfortunately, the actions of the righteous and just often only serve as a minor inconvenience to criminals looking to exploit others, and the fight against subversive elements within our society is a never-ending battle that we must all partake in, lest we wish to let evil ruin all that we hold dear. And when dealing with horrible situations, like the one that we've just gone over, it's important to recognize who committed these crimes, but as far as remembering the criminals, they should only be remembered as a footnote in the story of the innocents who lost their lives at their hands. Remember Molly Kyle, Anna Brown, Lizzie Kyle, George Bighart, Henry Rowan, Charles Whitehorn, and so many others who deserve to be remembered. So my friends, I hope this video has given you some more insight into a terrible tragedy that befell many of our fellow humans, and I hope you're closer now to understanding the Osage and their plight than you were before. And also, I hope the information you've received here spurs you to reading more into the history of the Osage through the works of David Gran, Louis F. Burns, and many others who have taken the time to chronicle their history and the suffering that can be found throughout it. I thank all of you for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil. And a massive thank you to all of my subscribers, my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank. And a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Check out links to my social media, Discord, and subreddit down below to keep up with the channel and to interact with the community and myself. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.